My name is Ed Bean. I am 46 years old, uh, Ed Bean the Younger. Uh, today is September 20th, 2015. We are in Sacramento, California, and I'm speaking with my father, Ed Bean. My name is also Ed Bean, and I'm 73 years of age. Today's date, September the 20th, 2015. Location is Sacramento, California. And the relation to my partner, it's my son. Also, Ed. All right. Thank you for doing this today. I'm really glad that you could, we could actually have this opportunity to sort of sit and, and talk. We're always having conversations around the coffee, t at the dinner table and whatnot, but I just thought it was so important that we have a chance to record some of this because so much has happened um, since you were a boy to the modern age. And I just wanted to talk with you about, you know, what was, basically what was life, life, life like when you were a kid? Well, son, the pleasure's all mine. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm sure there's a lot of things that we should have discussed in the past that we haven't really talked about or touched on. And I think this would probably give us a good opportunity to do so. And with this being archived, it could be good for our children, grandchildren, mm -hmm. their children, their grandchildren, mm -hmm. and their great-grandchildren. So this is a great opportunity for both of us. Agree, agree. So what was you, where did you, as a child, what was life like? Where'd you live? Well, I grew up in a little town in the south, and it's called Dotson, D-O-D-S-O-N, Louisiana, but it could have been called D-O-T. It was so small. We had a population of uh, probably, at the most, 1,500 people in the little community, and there was probably about 300 blacks in that community, and they were all related. And uh, it was a little town that was very uh, poor. We were very poor and uh, deprived and very segregated. Yeah. But one thing that we knew is that we were poor. But we didn't know anything about uh, being deprived at that time uh, or segregated because we looked at that as being the norm. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we grew older, uh, things actually began the change. We were, as I indicated earlier, we were very poor. Mm -hmm. and But my dad was pretty, a lot of ingenuity, mm -hmm. very energetic, very smart. And uh, we grew most of our food. Yeah. The only thing that we went to the store for was flour and occasionally sugar. Mm -hmm. We just grew our own corn. We made cornmeal. We killed our own animals uh, for the meat, potatoes, and all that stuff we grew it. So and I think that's one reason why we didn't know we were so poor. Not only did we do that, uh, my dad was very generous, and he actually fed the entire neighborhood. He rented a little farm of about eight acres, and uh, we grew a lot of a variety of things that we were able to feed the community. Were the rest of the community, did they farm also, or was it mostly your dad that was doing it? Well, my, my dad was probably the one that farmed and mm -hmm. uh, kind of was concerned about the entire community. We mm -hmm. had a, other few f people that farmed, and they actually sold their goods, but mm -hmm. uh, my dad actually shared his with the with the community. Yeah, I'm sure you have folks that probably are too old to get out there and work and things, too. Oh, right? oh, oh indeed yeah, so. Yeah. And, uh, and also when we kill our animals, primarily hogs, we shared that also mm -hmm. with the community, but it's a community where you don't, uh, we didn't have refrigeration at that time. Mm -hmm. And so we had to, one of the main things, you had to share it because you couldn't keep it all. And so what we tried to do was kill the animals and things like that during the winter. And then uh, during the winter, we could hold on to the meat a little longer. And mm -hmm. then we only had, also had a little smokehouse where we smoked meat, and that was mm -hmm. to preserve it a while longer. But uh, it was uh, it was an interesting interesting life, and uh, 
we had a little school that uh, three room schoolhouse and uh, and like I said it was uh, segregated uh, and uh, it uh, it's talking about being deprived uh, and uh, also growing up feeling somewhat inferior but uh, the own, your own people mm -hmm. made you feel somewhat inferior I don't know if they was aware of that uh, how would they do that well uh, in the schools, you would have school teachers who would uh, make a statement, uh, you know, why did you guys act like the white kids? And so we'll start getting the idea that, uh, you know, they didn't have an idea what what effect that was having on us. Mm -hmm. They were just trying to keep us in line, but it had a real adverse effect mm -hmm. on uh, on us. And uh, But things start uh, opening up and becoming more clearer. I remember a time I was walking down the street because that's one thing they always complain about when you're like riding on a bus or something like that to be quiet they would say why don't you guys act like the white kids and then one day I was walking down a railroad mm -hmm. track mm -hmm. and the bus stopped white bus and I heard all that noise mm -hmm. and I just could not believe it I didn't uh -huh. think and so that shows how you're conditioned to think a certain way when right. they, I just couldn't believe that uh, white kids act that way Right. but uh, it was uh, quite a awakening right that uh, maybe there wasn't a lot of difference yeah. right mm -hmm. what kind of interactions did you have with with members of the white community uh very very little mm -hmm. and uh one experience i had that uh, i would never forget because i was a little older and i was i'd start uh, uh figuring out that there was a little different mm -hmm. you know we were we were looked at as being less than. And so I remember the times the gentleman that my dad worked for, we used to clean bricks. Uh, that was where you tear down an old building and we had a lot of bricks around, a lot of brick buildings. And so this, uh, the, guy, young, the gentleman that my dad worked for, his son and I was there, he was a, a white young man. And so we were there cleaning bricks and, and then we start talking. And so I would call his dad Mr. Enos, mm -hmm. that was my dad's em employer, mm -hmm. and then uh, he would call my dad just Herman. I said, "Oh, wait a minute! Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's this is what I said. That I, that's something wrong about this picture." Mm -hmm. Then I said, "Then I decided that I would try to I would call his dad just Enos," and he got really upset, saying that I was being disrespectful, and so I was telling him, "My my dad is." I look at my dad as just as valuable as your dad, you know. And uh, so, but this is when I start feeling that there was a real difference in mm -hmm. looking at race relations, uh, people as being racist. And that's when I, that was my first right. real introduction because, like you said, ask uh, what type of interaction. We didn't have much interaction. Right. But, but that work experience uh, brought us together, something that probably would have never happened before. So it was like the, the slightest. Uh, hint that you were getting ready to step out of line yeah, or, yeah. or didn't know your place and yeah. sort of put exactly, you right back. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it uh, it moved on from there. And some of the things that kind of changed my life was uh, the fact that uh, I had a brother that, uh, that took a real interest in me. My brother Les, who died of cancer about about uh, a year and a half ago. And he gave me that head start that I needed. And I think I called it Head Start then, mm -hmm. before the Head Start program. Mm -hmm. But he would spend time with me, with my math, with my reading. He was smart. He was mm -hmm. a smart young man. And uh, so when I went to school, I was able to read, write, math, like my brother, he, mm -hmm. my brother Les. I mean, it was like he had a computer in his head. He could just go to a column of figures with, without even taking a breath. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was willing to impart that knowledge to me that uh, actually gave me that, that head start. Because when I went to school, I would be pulled out of my class in the second grade to go and read to the kids in the fifth and sixth grade in my little school. And, uh, and then uh, and knowing how to read, I think another thing that was a game changer for me in my life was the fact that my brother again he helped me put together a little bicycle 
because the guy was going to leave town, and so he was going to give up his paper route, and he wanted to give me that paper route. And so I was able to find her a frame here, or a rim here, a tie here, and put a bike together. Mm-hmm. And so I took over his paper route. And uh, so I would uh, go and uh, I would deliver the papers about uh, 4 o'clock in the evening, but I would get there early so I could read the paper. And so and, and, I, and I would just read everything. Uh, and then, uh, then I was able to uh, talk to people about things that uh, they had a little knowledge of, like baseball, like Jackie Robinson and Campanella and Pee Wee Reese and Phil Rizzuto, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, bring my uh, uncles and things up to date about who was in first place because they was, uh, they was baseball fans, but none of them could read. And like my dad... He couldn't read it all, mm-hmm. and uh, and I kind of found out why that was later on in life. See, my mom could read; she went to the third grade, but my dad, the male, never had a chance to go to school. Mm-hmm. They was uh, laborers and working to try to keep the family together and hunting and stuff like that to bring food. So my dad never had a chance to go. He never walked into a schoolroom door. But my mom, being female, she was able to go to the third grade, and she took real the advantage of that because she was able to read and write and uh, when you get your opportunity you might uh, might want to just kind of look at how schools got started down south I was talking with uh, my uh, my uh, sister-in-law's husband he's about 85 now and his grandfather was very instrumental in setting up the schools and if you get a chance look up Louisiana Normal and RMAL that was the first schools that were started in Louisiana. That's where my mom and them was able to go to school for during the months the way they didn't have to farm. And so uh, they was able to go to school. And, and my brother-in-law's grandpa actually started the school. And he actually also started Gramlin, was instrumental in getting Gramlin College started. And he was also instrumental in uh, getting a Southern University, the school that I attended, started. Mm-hmm. And so this kind of history stuff, just getting it from a young man that's 85 years old now mm-hmm. that could explain all that to me about education. And uh, like the teachers we had, uh, they were not uh, uh, credentialed or anything like that. They would go to school. Uh, they just learned just enough to come back to teach those people who couldn't read and write at all. Mm-hmm. And that's just what our teachers like, but they was uh, they done a very good job. And uh, but I was a kind of an avid reader. I just love reading, love education, mm-hmm. love learning. Did you and catch any flack for being a smart kid? Was that? Did you catch any flack? Well, for being it wasn't a smart like kid? that then. No, uh, it, it, it's not like it is today, mm-hmm. where the kids are afraid to be smart. No, it was an advantage to be smart uh, because we had the spelling bees where they would put you in a line, and if you missed a word, you go sit down. So you wanted to be the last person standing, mm-hmm. and so it was uh, important at that time to uh, to be proud that you was a good student. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it was uh, it was quite a community to grow in. Everybody was related. Everybody looked out for each other. And my back to my dad, uh, he was an individual that I didn't know that. Uh, the people really cared so much about him because he's a very quiet man. He didn't talk that much. He didn't smile that much. Uh, and I think he didn't smile a lot because of his teeth. You know, he didn't have uh, good, uh, good teeth. So he's a very small smile, never opened his mouth too wide. Just, uh, yeah. But and I didn't know that the people cared so much about my dad and realized what he'd done for that community. Uh, he was the type that he was the individual who uh, who was the grave dig- digger. He would get everybody ready to go out and dig the graves, and uh, and yeah, fine, no, continue. Yeah. And uh, and he would make sure the the graves were just perfect, perfect, squared up, perfect. And uh, then he was also the guy who was at church when there was a funeral. He would what they call tolling the bell. When the hearse would come around the curve, he would get out there and he would just toll the bell to let the people know that the the hearse was then on its way. And this would cause all the people to come out and 
started getting to the church. And, uh, but he was doing all those things, but I didn't know the people really cared him, you know, was that interested. But when my dad died, he died at 69 years old. He was uh, one, one day away from his 70th birthday. So I'm 73 now, so I'm older than my dad mm-hmm. when he passed. And when my dad died, we, you know, we have a reunion in our little town about uh, every, every two years. And we had more people that came back for my dad's funeral than ever came back for a reunion. Mm-hmm. And it was just, and then, you know, it was just uh, just great. I just never, never dreamed that my dad was uh, loved and, and cared for that much. Mm-hmm. It just would have been nice that if he would have known that, you know, that people cared right. so much before he went on. So, but it was a, a nice little community and uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting because you're, you're telling me that, you know, in school that you were excelling and that mm-hmm. you were smart and yeah. best in your class yeah. and yeah. all the things that you're interested in. On the other hand, you had uh, an outside world that was kind of oppressing you and telling you that you weren't worth much. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. How did you work all that out? How did you, I mean, that's a struggle for you to be able to well, say. Well, I, I tell you, it's, uh, you know, there's a few people in your life that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not, I could say, it, uh, it takes a village, but it takes an involved village. Mm-hmm. I mean, people got to be involved in your life. And uh, the person that made the difference in my life was uh, a principal, and she was uh, the, my cousin. And her name was Sadie Hollingsworth. And she made sure that we felt good about ourselves as being black. Uh, We would have plays and stuff that really put forth uh, the uh, inventions and the the, uh, things that uh, blacks had had done. Uh, And I don't know how she ever got that way, but she was a light years uh, ahead of us. And she was the first one in our community to get a TV. And she made us come to her house and sit down in the middle of the floor and watch black programs. There's only a few at that time, like Julia and some of the others. Uh, it wasn't a lot. And she made sure we knew who uh, Jackie Robinson was, who Roy Campanella was, all the sport figures. And... and, uh, and uh, a lot of the other few black politicians at the time. Uh, well, Martin Luther King, he was coming along, but uh, that wasn't his time. But uh, but some of the other black uh, individuals who'd uh, taken a stand years ago, mm. like Harriet Tugman and some of those people, she made sure that we knew black history. And I think that was some of the things that made a difference in, in, in our lives is... Uh, that one person, and the in our community, the same teachers that uh, taught us school was the same one that taught Sunday school. So we had them seven, uh, six days a week, because when we went to church, we were dealing with those same people we went to sc- that w- that we worked with in school throughout the week. So they knew us well, and they made sure that uh, that uh, we kept ourselves in line and. Uh, and move forward and progress. They, as a matter of fact, Mrs. Hollenworth was the one that took me to Southern University and said, boy, you're going to, you're going to college. You might not have any money, but you're going. And so I was able to get what they call a working scholarship where I worked for Building and Grounds. And, uh, and that was my entree into, into college. Uh, she drove me there, got me all set up, kind of like we mm. did. Mm-hmm. When we went to UC Santa Barbara, that's right. Yeah, Santa that's Barbara. right. Yeah. She made sure that we had all we needed, and then she <laughs> took the drive back, to, which was about 300 miles. That was about mm-hmm. 300 miles that she took two of us that she felt like that had promise of moving mm-hmm. forward, and uh, yeah. and and just that that young lady who made such a difference in our lives, and not only that, the pastor of our church, he was also instrumental in uh, letting you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Like being on time, I used to be just be praying that his car would not be in that ch- under that tree, because I wouldn't take the Sunday off. We had uh, Sunday school and everything every every uh, every every Sunday, but we had uh, like the pastor and everything. Then twice he came out of Monroe, Louisiana, 
twice a month to be at our church. Mm -hmm. But he was there for over 20 years, and he never missed a Sunday of being at church. And he was always there on time, and that taught us about punctuality. Mm -hmm. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. And he stressed that if you're going to be somewhere, be there on time. And, uh, and he was very instrumental in uh, growing up, too. And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have, uh, I mean, obviously you had free time for your studies. I know your dad was farming. Mm -hmm. Were you also helping in the farm, or did you, did you get a pass so you were able to work on your... No, there was no pass. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you study? There was no pass. Yeah. Uh, we would have time to study at night, and I uh, never forget that, because that's another one person that was, a, a person that was Caucasian that my the principal, Mrs. Holloway, talked about, and that was Abraham Lincoln. See, we did not have electricity. We did not have piped in water. You know, we had outhouses out back and, uh, and lamps with wicks and kerosene that we used. And uh, so studying at night meant that I had to take the old kerosene lamp, you know, fill it up with kerosene, and... Uh, with, with the lamp globe, had to clean the lamp globe so you could get the bright light. And uh, that's what I used to study by. And we had a little raggedy house, kind of like a log cabin. And the way I worked my way through that, uh, is that I said I was like Abraham Lincoln, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and I studied all the time, you know. It was tough, you know, but once you got that lamp clean and all that stuff, mm -hmm. you were ready to roll then. And you was good for, for about an hour and a half or two hours of bright light. Yeah. And uh, what were you imagining when you were in that candlelight sitting there and studying? What were you trying to work for? What did you hope would happen? Or what would be, you'd become? You know, I didn't have a good fix on it. But I knew that education was important. Like I was telling you about the newspaper that I read mm -hmm. every day. That way it took me on adventures mm -hmm. in other people's lives. What was possible? And uh, I didn't know just where I was going. I really didn't know until my, my teacher told me that I was going to college. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a good grasp, but I know I wanted to be prepared for whatever, but I didn't know what course I was going to take or anything like that. But I, I definitely wanted to be prepared, and being prepared means that you need mm -hmm. a good education. So uh, I wanted to be able to compete. Right. And whatever the world had out there to offer me, but I had no idea at that time gotcha. because I'd never seen a black doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing. The only thing that I saw that where people made a little money was school teachers, and that was about it. And our greatest aspiration one day was to become a school teacher, and that yeah. was about it. I'd never yeah. seen a black doctor, never seen a black professor, nothing. So it was very limited. Right. Yeah. And so this decision eventually to leave Dodson that comes because. Someone told you you were going to college. Yeah, someone told me I was if going. If that person's not there, you stay in Dotson? I would have stayed in Dotson. I stayed still in Dotson. Been there. Just that one person yeah. that believed in me. They yeah. knew more than basically my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. They didn't know anything about college, so mm -hmm. they never could have directed me in that, that mm -hmm. way. But uh, she had been to college, the little college I was talking about, mm -hmm. yeah, where she went uh, like during the summer to improve herself. And... Uh, and eventually she got a, a credentials, uh, but it, it took a while. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so how did your, what did you learn when you got to college? It's a big world out there. You learned some oh, things. Oh, yeah. That was a big world. And uh, so when I got there, the, the first year was just somewhat of regular studying, you know, trying to get adjusted and uh, being away from home and all that kind of stuff, never being away from home before in my life. And being 300 miles from away from home, it, it took some getting uh, adjusted to, but uh, I was able to do that. And then uh, later on, it was during the 60s when it was rough, and uh, during the demonstrations, and, and I was quite involved in uh, uh, the demonstrations to try to make things better, to get uh, black folks working in stores and things of that nature so we were downtown Baton Rouge and where you see the tear gas and water hose and uh, running over you at horses and we were all a part of that 
right in the middle. I know I spent about a week in an infirmary just from the tear gas. Just down that thoracic region here, it's, it's, it's hell. Mm-hmm. Tear gas without a mask is hell. But, uh, but I think it was worth it. And, uh, and uh, they, they indicated that, uh, but what happened, we fought for that. And uh, so, and they start putting black people into the stores. And then, but you know, it was full of tricks. And so what they start doing is putting the mulattoes, who's very light-skinned blacks. And so we had to come back and start demonstrating. Always oh, like I, checkers or is, is that sort of thing? Is that what you, by yeah. putting them, allowing them to work in the stores? What is that? When you said, um, when you said putting them in the stores, you meant? Working. Working, working in, in working the stores, in the stores as yeah. cashiers. Cashiers or, and stuff, but there mm-hmm. was no blacks. There was actually mm-hmm. mulattoes, and they were the group that they not accepted as being white, so Mm -hmm. we had to go to our schools, and so they was pulling those tricks on us. Mm -hmm. And so we had to go back demonstrating against our own people. And uh, so, and then later on they decided that uh, we were just getting too, too, too tough, too rough, and so they closed down the university. (laughs) Closed down Southern. (laughs) Closed down Southern University Mm -hmm. for about a month and a half. I think the governor at that time was a guy named McKinnon. You don't hear much about him today. Mm -hmm. But he closed the university down, and the only way we knew that we were closed, we were sitting in the student union, and I don't even think the president of our university knew we were closed. The person who did know we were closed was Walter Cronkite. Mm-hmm. And I never will forget Walter Cronkite come out while we're sitting at Student Union saying the largest black university in the South is now closed. Mm-hmm. And that's how we found out we were closed. Mm-hmm. And so we would just went and started packing our stuff and, and getting ready to go home because we know if Walter said it, it was the truth. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but uh, the college life was, was great. Uh, and I, Spent a lot of time that I was uh, in charge of building and grounds and at Southern University, and I got to meet a lot of interesting people because my uh, young man from our school at, at uh, Pinecrest High School in Winfield, he was uh, in charge of the guest house. And so uh, when the guests would come in, he would uh, call me to come and kind of show the guests around the campus, and I got a chance to meet uh, Muhammad Ali to show him around the camps, campus. Leah Teen Price, I don't know if you've heard of her mm-hmm. first. She's a mezzo-soprano. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nancy Wilson, I had a chance to show her around. Jerry Butler, I had a chance to show him around the campus. Uh, Kurt Flood, baseball player, mm-hmm. chance to show him around the campus. So it was a great opportunity. It was a great learning experience for me. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it was it was a good ride. School was a good ride. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. So you finish with school. Mm-hmm. You graduate. Mm-hmm. You finish up with school. Mm-hmm. Now it's time. The next stage in your life. Where did you decide to go? And how did you decide? Well, I, I had a little time. I was uh, looking at uh, going back home, going to work. Mm-hmm. And, but I decided I had a little break, and so what I was going to do is come to California to visit my brothers who lived in Modesto. I had uh, t- uh, two brothers there in Modesto, and so I was coming out to visit them for a couple of weeks. So I came out here, and uh, and uh, and I think one of the things that was really inspiration, the thing that I'd been fighting for, freedom, respect, I went to Dennis Restaurant in uh, Modesto, and I sat down where I didn't have to sit at the back, where I could just walk in the front door and sit down and have a hamburger. That hamburger did not taste like a hamburger. I really wasn't ready for what I'd been fighting for. and. Uh, because that inf- being inferior, you know, mm-hmm. that was still there. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it was, and that was one thing that I had to fight hard for it to overcome. Because I knew to be successful in this environment, I had to be strong. And so uh, once I went through that experience, uh, it just really made me stronger. Mm-hmm. Really made it. And then after that, I found a job uh, working uh, 
the next day I had a job working at Sundar Restaurant there in Modesto with the Gallus Brothers. And uh, they were just fantastic people because that's who my brother would work for, the Gallus's. And uh, then after that, I worked on the, on the ranch where they had a ranch out there, a large ranch. And then within about three months, I had a, a job at the Five Mile Job Corps up in the hills of Sonora. And that's where I really got my start at the, the Job Corps Center. And within a few years, I was supervising lieutenant colonels and master sergeants. And uh, so that meant that I felt as though I was had arrived. I had arrived. Mm -hmm. I mean, like like uh, uh, Jesse Jackson said, mm -hmm. I started feeling like Thought somebody. You were somebody. Somebody. Had yeah. some money in your pocket. Yeah, I had and some money in my pocket. That's yeah. right. So it was, it was a great great feeling okay. and uh, respect mm -hmm. because that's what we really want in life is to be re carry ourselves in such a way where people re respect us and, mm -hmm. and I was getting that respect that I always fought for and, and, and wanted to have and to give back. It was an opportunity to give back to these kids mm -hmm. because they were kids that came from all over the United States. Uh, either they was coming to Five Mile Job Corps or they was going to CYA. They had the choice. So we got some really tough kids, but we really made a difference. We was a part of the Forest Service, and uh, we would take the kids out to fight forest fires and do all that kind of stuff. We had a carpenter program. We had a heavy equipment program. So when kids left our program, they was quite well prepared, mm -hmm. well prepared. So yeah. I've done a lot of different things. Yeah. yeah. So you're going from there and... Somewhere along the way, you start a family, but something <laughs> important happened in between. <laughs> oh, <is that> so, <laughs> what you have in mind? Well, talk, tell me about how you met mom. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. Yeah. So the way uh, I met your mom, it was just it, it was just just happened because what had uh, my brother was uh, your mom at that time worked at doctor's hospital, and my brother was in the hospital out there in surgery. So I was there, and uh, I saw this young lady was walking down the corridor with such grace and carried herself, and I said, wow, who is that, you know? And so uh, we met, and, and we talked, and uh, I was very impressed with her. And so we set up a date in the park out there in California in about the next couple of days or something. So we met there. And, and we talked, and uh, then after that, uh, we took a trip with her parents to San Francisco, and it was 100 degrees and 105 degrees in Modesto, and I went to San Francisco with short sleeves on. <laughs> <laughs> that was the coldest day of our life. Uh, that that uh, evening I spent in San Francisco, I almost froze. I didn't know so you could the temperature could change so much mm -hmm. in, in 90 to 95 miles. But, uh, and that was quite an experience. But, uh, and we, we, we dated off and on for, for probably over a year. And, uh, and then I talked with her dad. He was a Pentecostal preacher. And so I asked him about marrying his daughter. And he told me the only way that I would marry his daughter was that I had to be saved, sanctified, and filled with the fire. And I said, sir, I got none of that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're a, we're said, a long I, way. I got yeah. none of that. Uh, and he said, well, I'm going to tell you one thing then, son. I will never, you will never walk my daughter down the aisle. I said, well, we'll, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. And so I uh, so he wouldn't walk her down the aisle. We set the date and all that to get married. And so, so what we did, we went on up on the streets of Modesto to a justice of peace, and uh, and we got married. We didn't even know we, you needed a witness. And so, uh, and so someone was passing the door, and so we just flagged them. Hey, come in. <laughs> we need a witness here, and we had someone. They said, lady came in signed his witness and the, mm -hmm. the marriage and she went on her way and uh, and that could was, not have gone over well 
But I remember, I, I remember Grandpa, and he was a formidable person. So yeah. I mean, there must have been no, it didn't, some blowback. It, it, no, it, there was that was that was blowback. But uh, over the year, over the months, he learned to that I was a pretty good guy. I may not have been had all that stuff he wanted me to have, but mm-hmm. uh, but uh, but it, it worked out. Mm-hmm. He toned down, and we got to be the best of friends. Yeah, That's we really good. did. Uh, but uh, he was a very religious, religious guy into his Pentecostal ministry, and he had his own church. And uh, and but I knew that it wasn't for me. You know, I was mm-hmm. going to Southern Baptist all my life, Christian, and I, I just knew that I. I that the Pentecostal environment was not my place, and so, but we worked our way through it. We worked See, our way through it. Mm-hmm. You guys got married. Yeah. And I came along. Yeah, you was the first one, right? Uh, um, and we ended up moving to from Modesto. We to, moved from Modesto. We moved to Merced. And you were following Find a me. job there. Yeah, I was with the uh, Wells Fargo Bank. I was an officer with the uh, Wells Fargo Bank, so I'm missing out on. Uh, uh, so mm-hmm. no, it's just the, the, the progression. It seemed more like. What oh, I said. I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. That, no, that's fine. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I started out uh, after leaving. I was at the Job Corps Center for about six years, and then mm-hmm. I, I took a job uh, in a management training program with Wells Fargo Bank. Uh, and uh, so I completed the uh, management uh, program, and and then I was assigned to the Modesto Main office as a as, a, as an officer of uh, Wells Fargo Bank, the first black banking officer ever in Modesto. And uh, that's and, a long uh, way from Dotson. Long way. I'd, I'd come a long way. Yeah. And uh, the first black officer there in Modesto, and there was a lot of firsts there in Modesto. I was the first to uh, be uh, invited into the Junior Chamber of Commerce. We put on all the California relays and things uh, uh, there. And I was the first to be appointed to the uh, Human Rights Commission there in Modesto. I was on the board with uh, Bob Gallo and those guys who own uh, Gallo Winery. And I was the first to be on the uh, first black ever on the Modesto County Grand Jury, the first. So uh, there was a lot of firsts there. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I went on to work in Merced and one of the first blacks that was ever a member of the Kiwanis Club. <laughs> I so I was kind of a trail. I, I was kind of a trailblazer, which uh, which I really, but I was prepared for that because going through the demonstrations and everything down south prepared me. It made me strong and uh, to push myself. Even when there was a little fear there, I was able to push myself and, and overcome. And uh, when I felt as though that uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I couldn't measure up, I, I pushed myself and I found out it was more there than than I realized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I'd had a lot of different experiences in this journey, a lot of different experiences, a lot of growth as we went along. Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. I I really want to thank you for the for coming out today. We're kind of reaching the end we of our time. The, yeah. we, okay. it, it went faster than yeah, you would imagine, fast, right? Yeah, and there's did. like a lot of other things we'd still mm-hmm. like to talk about. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, how much time we have? Uh, we have about forty five seconds. Forty five seconds? Is that right? I wanted to cover yeah. this, but I can't cover it. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Should we do it again? We'll, yeah, we'll have an opportunity yeah. too. But thank you so much. Um, I mean, I mean, thank you for sharing your story. Mm-hmm. Thank you for being there for us, mm-hmm. uh, and thank you for all you. I'm actually, as I'm listening to you, I'm hearing so many parallels mm-hmm. in my own life, but I also am learning a little bit about motivations for mm-hmm. you, like your brother sitting down and working so hard with you on your math and, mm-hmm. and how you uh, do that with my kids. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I can see now what, what you're imparting to them. It's, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. you're trying to help provide that future the way it was given to you. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure. And thank you, son. Right. Appreciate it.